going on, everyone? Welcome to Speed Bumps Live. How you doing, Paul? Dude, I am doing great. How are you? Fantastic, man. You know, it's uh, yeah. our final episode uh, going in live. For season one. For season one, for season one. Season and, finale. Uh, season, that's right, season finale. We have an awesome guest today, and I got to tell you that I'm pretty stoked because uh, talking to Nicole is always a pleasure. She always has so many great insights to tell us, and uh, this is going to be great. And for all of you joining us for the first time, Speed Bumps Live is a weekly show that discusses marketing challenges and opportunities uh, with many leaders from different industries. I'm Javier Santana. I'm co-founder at Launch, an experienced design agency here in Atlanta. Yeah, and I'm Paul Carpenter, client relations at Lion Star Films. We're a video production studio focused on branded content communications. Awesome. All right. Um, so real quick, before we uh, bring Nicole on, uh, in which she is hiding behind door number three here. Uh, I did want to mention that just as always, we, uh, while we have the chat feature off, uh, we do have the Q&A open. So look down at the bottom, click on the Q&A and start uh, firing some questions away. Uh, the show is only better when uh, Javier and I aren't asking questions. So, that's right. That's right. Uh, so start, yeah, start jumping in and ask away. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, let's get let's get started. Awesome. So today's guest is uh, Nicole Bueno. Uh, she's VP of Marketing at Tackle.io, and uh, they're a company that helps software companies drive uh, revenue through the cloud marketplace. Uh, prior to Tackle, Nicole was CMO at UserIQ. She built uh, the marketing department from scratch. That's how we met many moons ago, um, and uh, you know helped launch their GTM strategy, resulting in a significant ARR growth. She has 15 years of experience in building brands implementing marketing programs to align marketing and sales and championing team and revenue growth. And oh, by the way, she also founded and leads the Atlanta chapter of Revenue Collective. Um, I mean, you, you just must not be busy at all, Nicole. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Javier and Paul. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Well, let's, let's jump really quickly into your background because, you know, in the conversation that we had earlier, um, you started in the agency world and then you transitioned into uh, marketing because you had this passion for MarTech and automation. I mean, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got started. Sure. So um, I graduated with a degree in public relations and then did a, some stints at some smaller agencies. You know, one was focused in the hospitality space and one in the commercial real estate space. And then I moved to an agency that was focused on healthcare IT for B2B software companies. And while I was there, I was getting my MBA at night in marketing, and we were growing pretty rapidly at a, as an agency at that time. And so there was an opportunity to lead marketing for the agency. And I think we kind of thought, you know, this will just be not really a full-time job, but pretty soon my team started to grow. And at that time, we were experimenting with marketing automation tools for ourselves. Um, first using Marketo and then moved over to Pardot and really saw an opportunity that we could begin leveraging those for our customers as well, because none of our customers, you know, healthcare IT sometimes tends to be a laggard industry. <laughs> and a lot of it, you know, I can't imagine, I don't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but a lot, you know, many of our clients weren't using marketing automation. Um, so what I started to do was, you know, build this program, really, you know, manage services around creating the whole package for um, our customers. So I would really do, you know, all the pre-sale efforts of, you know, kind of pitching them around their benefits of marketing automation. And then I would go and implement um, Pardot or Marketo or HubSpot for them, build them out, drip nurturing programs, and then kind of integrate it with all their PR and marketing efforts as well. So kind of the full service to make sure that then they were driving leads and could pass them off to sales and measure them. So that was really where I got interested in, okay, you know, there's this whole SaaS world. Um, here's how it all works together. And this is really cool. And I really like this side of marketing operations and marketing technology. And that's where I really got kind of introduced to it was at this agency I was at. Wow. And how did that transition over to uh, going into the startup world? Yeah. So um, we got acquired um, by a PE firm. And, you know, after being there for a little bit after that, I decided to see what was next for me. And there was a company called User IQ, and I thought what they were doing was really cool because 
I had spent so much time on this buyer side journey of marketing automation and user IQ was kind of like, here's what's next. Um, you can f figure out like what your customers are doing. And they were a platform focused on everything that your customers are doing. So acquisition, retention, expansion, and advocacy for customers. And how do you keep your customers and retain them? And so there is this opportunity to start the marketing team there and lead that and build a program around like, you know, how do we market the solution that we have? Um, the team was really small when I joined. It was only eight people there. We were in a really small room at um, a startup incubator, ATDC at Georgia Tech. And I was like, this sounds like fun. Um, I'll do it. Let's go. <laughs> That's awesome. And by the way, sh quick shout out to Erica. I look, I think she's on with us and, uh, you know, worked with you back in those days. And that was a lot of fun working with you guys. Yes, and Javier did our web, first website at User IQ, and I think our product side web um, app version as well. So that yeah. is how I got to meet Javier, and it was awesome and a friendship that has continued for many years. That's since right. Then. That's right. Wine so, therapy. Is, wine. Is we talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of therapy, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you like, getting to know you, Nicole. You've gone. Like you, you just went right into it. You got your hands dirty, mm -hmm. uh, CMO level, uh, but obviously at a startup. Um, and but but in getting your your hands dirty, uh, tell tell us a little bit because the show isn't about just you know backgrounds and everything. This is about challenges, opportunities. It's the speed bumps uh, in marketing that we all face. Uh, Tell us about some of the speed bumps you've had going into the startup world. Yeah, so I would say probably like, you know, going into user IQ, um, it was, you know, really trying to figure out like who we wanted to be and how, how to define this space. Um, it was figuring out like it was a really new company and it had been really, you know, engineering focused and a little bit of sales led and we are new to marketing going in and so you know we kind of thought like we're going to create this category um we know who what it is and you know we are trying to call this category customer growth um we you know we didn't really uh, i think at the time like have a lot of resources and budget to do a lot of what we we're doing and we maybe didn't spend the time um, either of like doing a ton of research on it. It was more like our internal thoughts around, hey, this is who we think we are and we should build this category. And, you know, maybe hearing some like pressure from other people, you know, whether that's board members or whoever, like, yeah, you guys should do this. Like, we think your company's great. Go do that. And, um, you know, I think that was like a really big misstep, you know, as maybe being like a younger marketer and that being like my first, um, you know, leading marketing role, not taking, not having, I guess, maybe like the wherewithal to step back and say, whoa, like before we go build a category, um, we need to do, we need to really like make sure we understand our audience and our customers and have data to back this up because we realize like it's, it's very, very hard to build a category. Um, you don't just go in there and like start doing content and then people are finding it and saying like, right. oh yeah, you own that. Um, you know, we did a lot of different things with SEO and um, content and building our brand around that. And then we kind of realized like there was a customer success category also being created and we really fit more naturally into that without having to like do customer growth. Customer success was a good fit. And, you know, we really, I think pivoted more towards that and user IQ is a great customer success platform tool. And then we had a lot more success when we, we actually like looked at our data and, you know, um, I think surveyed our customers and did really heavy market research and could say, hey, this is what we're doing. And then once we started doing all those um, tactics that related to customer success or like um, keyword terms and SEO that related to customer success and content, that's where we were really successful. But it was a steep learning curve at first. Interesting. Yeah. Um in doing that, you had some you had some wins, but it sounds like you had a lot of losses, and you uh, learned from those. And I'm assuming you've passed those along. And we'll get to we'll get to some of those techniques or or approaches here shortly. But what are some other things that that you look to do, or where you see success uh, from a marketing standpoint? Um, I think you know when we talked earlier. 
and, and in your background, there's this bridge between sales and marketing. And we've had some other conversations with other guests and how a lot of times naturally those two entities, while it's sales and marketing, it tends to be sales or marketing right. uh, approaches. So talk a little bit about like some of the things you experimented with um, to help kind of get that awareness with when you are talking about a, a new category. For sure. Yeah. I think some of the biggest things you can do are sit down and talk to your sales team. Um, they're the boots on the ground. They're having conversations every single day with good fit and bad fit prospects. You know, they're moving them through the funnel. And so they understand like what makes someone the perfect fit for your product and what doesn't make someone a good fit. So if you're ignoring that research um, and like their opinions on that, and not getting the data, then that's a really big loss. Um, you know, there's some great tools out there as well that if you can't sit down and like have every conversation with your sales team or, um, you know, maybe you're remote now, everyone's remote, so it makes it a little more challenging, um, you know, coming into, we're a completely remote company. And so when I came in to tackle it, you know, it's like, oh, how do I do this without being face to face with my sales team and just overhearing what they're saying on the phone? But we use a tool called Gong and, you know, there's other tools like that as well. And, you know, you can set up different keyword phrases in there. So like, are, they, are you hearing this word come up? Um, are you hearing another word come up and search that and kind of start seeing trends and patterns and just observe sales calls, listen to them and see what you're hearing. And I think that as a marketer gives you a lot of insight into what, you know, you should be marketing or what you should not be marketing and doing as a good starting point. And so, um, yeah, it's a big miss if you don't do that. And then also I think talking to your customer success team too and hearing, you know, what are the pain points that they're hearing from customers once they're using your product? Because- so, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Paul. No, I was just gonna say, so everybody heard it here first. <laughs> sales and marketing coexist <laughs> right yeah. and all it takes is a little bit of that that open communication and uh I, I i love how we talk to a lot of amazing marketing leaders and i'm seeing a common theme now that we're on episode 10 there's a lot that is just the the, the fundamentals that we we often need to get back to and having that communication with your sales team um, and understanding that is amazing is there anything in that that you're able to glean out and when, when talking to sales folks uh, that kind of helps with your content marketing approach? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that like any, the stuff from that I'm here from sales, like we'll find out not so much a tackle for which we can talk about later, but like, you know, we found out about at user IQ, we had found out about new competitors that might, we might not they are rapidly like encroaching on what we're doing. That's a great one to have on our radar and let's start doing some competitive ads around that. So that's really interesting. Um, and it would also be like certain ways that someone would describe the product. Um, and I was like, oh, I wouldn't have thought to say it that way. And then you might hear it a few different times and you're like, I'm gonna start doing some more content with some of those key phrases. And you know, I wanna make sure that if people are searching for that phrase then, that they're finding us if they're going to Google and searching like that. You know, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, we talk about customer success a lot, but there may be some junior marketers, you know, that are listening or listen to this later that think about, well, what does that really mean? Like, can you level set what that is? What is customer success um, at, as what you did in uh, user IQ, but also how you define it in general? Yeah, so I define customer success as, you know, the point that they pick up as soon as like, kind of the contract's been signed and they're helping you, they're making sure that the customer, you're not churning. Um, they're responsible for the success and the growth of that customer throughout their whole life cycle. And I think it's such a critical role in every software company and other yeah. companies too, but especially I think right now in our current environment, um, you know, it's, it's hard to go out and sign new customers right now for a lot of companies, you know, people are freezing budgets. So paying a special attention to the ones you have is 
that's huge. Like you marketing right. needs to be working hand in hand with their customer success team and saying like, okay, how can we make sure like we're marketing to our existing customers and they have what they need to be successful, like inside our product and that we're even, you know, retaining, you know, how can we retain and upsell them as well? But the customer success teams, I think had one of the hardest jobs to in a company and oh, yeah, for sure. Resources. <laughs> Yeah, customer retention is uh, is is not easy, um, but you know, providing the proper customer service obviously um, really does help that. And it's interesting because we've had this uh, come up several times, uh, specifically in companies that transition to SaaS, rather that were SaaS born, because before if you bought the box, you were stuck with the investment. Now you're not. Now you really are. You have to make sure that they have everything they need. You're pro you have proper training tools and everything. Otherwise, you're just going to go to your competitor because mm -hmm. the prices are probably competitive and and you're doing similar things, right? With, with the exception of some really uh, high profile value propositions. But um, let's, let's transition the conversation a little bit because you, know, you, you went uh, agency side, MBA at night, you weren't sleeping really, I'm sure. And then- <laughs> Kind of uh, like right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In, like, I don't know, I haven't slept in a long time. <laughs> it's kind of masochistic, right? Because the startup world, as you know, it's like you're like on it by like day and night. It's like you roll yeah. over, you check your email, you go to sleep, you check your email. <laughs> but you did that, then you went to um, you know, user IQ and you learned a lot. Um, it sounds like the company as a whole learned a lot about new categories, but you did a lot of amazing things. And I'm assuming that there was some you know, pleasure and pain principles out of that right you walk out you're like oh god that sucked but oh my god that's amazing and then you come out of something like that and I look at it almost like doing an iron man right you're like all right I succeeded all right I'm gonna go do it again so then you go to tackle to do the same exact thing right you go to this company that has a, a unique category that is is playing in a space that is quasi unknown to a lot of folks I, look, how did you get there? I mean, what was the thought behind it? And where you say, yeah, you know, I just want to give it another run. Let me just go ahead and uh, do something Let's like do that. another marathon. Do another marathon. What the hell? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So I'm, I guess since I'm not a marathon runner, this is like my crazy. <laughs> thing that I, do. <laughs> I just go to companies to be like the first marketer in and I just have to, there's some madness behind it. Like, trust me, my husband tells me this all the time that, are you sure? Like you're going to do this? <laughs> but yeah. So I, I don't think, you know, I think a really good thing just for like career seekers and anyone out there to think about is I don't think I've gotten any job, I don't know, in the last 10 years from just like submitting a resume somewhere, you know, right. it's all been through networking and people I know, um, you know, talking to other people and getting them. And that's how I found out about Tackle. I don't think I would have found out about them through any other way. I mean, the job was posted on the website, but they're not an Atlanta company. Like I said, they're completely remote. and I mean, no one reached out to me about the position, but um, through Kyle Porter, the CEO of Sales Loft, um, he had been talking to our CRO. They had been connected and, you know, our CRO, Don, asked, hey, do you know any great marketers? We're looking for one. And that's how I got connected to them. Yeah. So it was just great. I think when you can have a good network where that, that's the kind of things that happen. And I was just really blown away by, I think, what Tackle was doing. Um, I don't know much, didn't know anything really about cloud marketplaces at first, but I was like, wow, this seems like a really cool space of what they're doing and where they're playing. Um, so I just, you know, really started investigating it further. And one of the things that was really important to me was like understanding if a company has product market fit. And because I think there's like a really great, there's a lot of articles about it, but there's one by like Udi Lettergore. He's the CMO of Gong. And he talks about that's the one thing a marketer can't fix. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of things you can fix, but yeah. not that. Like you can't go in and fix your product and the market if they're not going to accept it. And, you know, I really wanted to see like, is there a need for this product? Um, do they have happy customers? And, you know, I'm looking at their website, I'm talking to people and I'm like, wow. They do like they have really great big these enterprise customers that are happy about them that are happy with them. They're talking about them on their website. They have great case studies. Um, you know, I think it's important to look at like churn and retention rates at the company as well for customers. Um, you know, learn that from the customer success time at User IQ, <laughs> and um, and then also examine like what does the competitive field look like? And that's not necessarily a bad thing when there are competitors, but how can you position yourself differently and it is interesting, like Tackle had no competitors. Um, they're built, the competitors build it yourself or buy Tackle. 
And that's when I was really like, okay, this really is the unique opportunity I've been looking for as a marketer to get to go and build a category. The playing field is my complete great green space to go do this. And I really want, I've always wanted to do that as a marketer, just really get to do it. So I was like, I'm all in. That's nuts. And, but you literally walked in, you did a little bit of research on the company. You, you said, this is awesome. No category. I'm all in. And you just literally dove in. How long did that take? Or was it literally like, like you spend the day looking at yourself in, put me in. It was, it was a, little, a little bit longer process than that. But <laughs> yeah, coach, I'm ready. Yeah. 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 Just a day. Like, yeah, you guys can do, give me the offer now. I'm ready to go. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting because we talked to Vicki Wilkins and she does uh, um, executive placement. And uh, she talked about how some marketers um, have never really even had to look for a job, you know, and, and they may be in a situation now where they're like, all right, well, you know, the economy is changing, things are changing. I don't know where to start. You know, yeah. fortunately, you have been one of those folks that you really haven't had to seek out a lot of work. And I think that our industry is starting to be one of those that is constantly recruiting. You did something awesome for this company. I need somebody that like you to come do it for me. And it, it's amazing, like uh, from a senior level marketer standpoint, um, there is uh, a lot of gigs out there to do a lot of really yeah. cool stuff. There is. Yeah. What are, um, real quick, I want to I want to dive in a little bit deeper between some of the things you're doing at Tackle. Um, is there, you know, it, it sounds like in a in a place where you're creating a new category in many ways, and you don't have a lot of competition, what are some different strategies or things you're doing between outbound and inbound? Yeah, so it's interesting because, um, you know, I'm used to like coming in and building a big inbound strategy and program, and like we are starting to do that now, but they have tackle, what they do is they work with um, software companies and help get them to drive revenue from the cloud marketplaces. So AWS, Microsoft, and Google Cloud are the three they work with. And they have had really strong relationships with them. So we've had a great program of the cloud providers actually just referring customers to us because there is no one else. So the cloud providers want more sellers on marketplace. And when someone wants to get listed really quickly, we can do that with our software. Like we help you get up and running, you know, sometimes in a week, you know, at the most it might take six weeks, but it is a fast, really fast process. And then we're providing you all the downstream reporting on your transactions. And so it's great to have that pipeline and inbound flow from the cloud provider. So a bit of a different motion, but you know, we want to expand beyond like that world and get other companies that might not have been thinking about marketplace. So I think there's a few things we're doing as we're like really building this category around what we do. And the first is educating people around why marketplace, because a lot of companies might not even be really thinking about this yet, even though they have a strategic relationship with the cloud provider, because if you're a software company, like you're leveraging AWS or Microsoft or Google, like your software is hosted on one of those platforms. So you have credits with them and you have that money. So you do have a relationship, but educating them on like what marketplace is and what are the benefits. And then kind of after that, and we're doing that through a lot of content and our SEO work right now. And then after that process, it's kind of like the why tackle aspect of it. Um, what do we provide to you? Um, and so that's a lot through like our product marketing. What does our product do? And then I think another component is just being everywhere. I want everyone to see tackle every place that our potential buyers could be. So building that brand and getting it in front of everyone's face. Um, you know, they should see us at, I would say events, but like virtual events. So, you know, we want to be showing up in those places. We want to be on LinkedIn. You know, we want to be on um, social media sites, um, just show, you know, the brand should be very prominent. I love when people come to us and say, I've seen you guys everywhere. I've heard of you so many times. I had to check you out and see what you were doing. I think that's a great sign. And they might not even remember like where they've seen us or heard of us. Just good. It just means but that's like, okay. Yeah. Awareness, okay. awareness matters. That's, that's, uh, that's a, a big, big battle. You, nobody's going to buy you if they don't know about you. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I think you're working on the brand a little bit as well right now, correct? We are, yeah. So we're going through kind of a transition period right now um, and doing some 
messaging work, um, a brand redesign and website work as well. So uh, yeah, kind of a big transition that we're rolling out in early September. So really exciting to do all that. But I think you're also branding right now with the color choice. I am, yeah. <laughs> yes, always be branding. You guys kind of are too. You're kind of in our tackle blue colors as well. So I like. <laughs> yeah, that was that was definitely planned. <laughs> <laughs> I like how we can coordinate. <laughs> okay. Um, real quick question. Let's go back for a second. And Paul, I'm gonna steal your thunder here because yeah, I of course. Know, I know you wanted to know a lot about this. But considering, and we don't like to talk too much COVID stuff here, but considering that now everybody's working remote. Um, and for some folks, it's easy, you know, we have an agency and we typically have very flex schedule, very easy for us with technology to work remote. However, for some companies, they're having to reinvent themselves working remote. Tackle is a 100% remote company. Um, how do you create a culture? How do you make sure that people are always connected and, and in that type of environment, right? Because I think that the lessons that you guys have learned from the very get-go will help some companies as they continue to evolve. Yeah, I think that's great. And I know so many people like are dealing with this right now and trying to figure out, especially like leadership members that might be coming on. Um, I think we've done a really good job of this with, you know, different tools, you know, there's Slack, there's Zoom, obviously, you know, we're people that are video on 24 seven and meetings. Right. Like, I think it just makes it easier to have conversations when you can see faces, like don't turn your video off, just, just have those conversations. That's kind of like one of our ground rules for things. Um, I would say like kind of another ground rule is don't <laughs> be overly sensitive about Slack. Um, you know, sometimes it's not easy to understand tone and Slack and you could easily take something that someone is in a meeting, they're busy, they're just like, yeah, writes a con. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm offended by what they right. say. Just ask someone or things like that. But you know, we've used a lot of great tools, I think, just to make everyone feel connected in the company. Um, we're a big, our company's remote because we believe in everyone doing their best work everywhere, wherever they are and kind of living their best life, I would say. And so we have a lot of different channels dedicated to wellness and um, health and doing that. Like, and people post things. I feel like it's almost daily of just things they're doing, whether they went for a run during lunch, um, they went for a hike that morning or they're this weekend, they're going for a camping trip. So I feel like you really, like, I don't, I've never seen a company that does that. And it's really cool. Like you just feel like you get to know your coworkers on a new right. level, you see their outside of work activity. So I think things like that are really important and cool to make people feel connected and you have these conversations with them. Um, another thing we've done is we we do this thing, it's called Donut. It's a bot in Slack that you can add. And every two weeks it pairs you up with someone. And so we have, um, I feel like everyone in the company participates in it. And we, you have 30, a 30 minute phone call with someone or a Zoom call, and you're not allowed to talk about work on it. You just have to talk about other things, get to know the person. And so that's been a really, a really cool way, I think, for everyone to just kind of connect and get to know each other too, outside of, I would say, regular work meetings. Hey, Hob, I, I, I see maybe an, another show idea. Uh, maybe we need to have our own donut show. It's, uh, you know, where everybody just comes on and just gets to know one another beside, outside of the marketing leadership and experience uh, that would yeah, be I, I really like that a lot that's it's really neat man it's it's a it's a really interesting concept you know for us we just uh, um, did our first hire of someone that we've never met physically and it's a and it's a senior level role and I think that that's just that's how we're starting to evolve um, to a point where that's just going to be the norm so yeah. so the idea of that is really interesting because you know, I've been in this business for a really long time and I'm accustomed to sitting in a room with someone, getting to know them, you read body language, you yeah. look at chemistry and things of that nature. And now we have to adapt looking at a two dimensional box on a screen and mm -hmm. really start thinking, you know, like you said, like on Slack, you can't judge tone. Like, what the hell are they thinking right now? <laughs> like, you don't know, right? You can't really judge it. So it's, uh, it's an interesting dynamic. And when you look at a company who was actually, you know, born 100% remote, it's, it's pretty fascinating, um, specifically from a cultural standpoint, because, you know, not only culture, but values and, and togetherness and how people, you know, uh, a single belief system of sorts. It's, it's really fascinating that you guys have been able to pull that off. So uh, taking notes from what you guys are doing, for sure. Yeah. yeah. 
Another cool tool is Loom, if you've heard of that, um, for videos. And right. we've been using that a lot, like, you know, trying not to do Zoom overload and have like meetings, just have a meeting because you want to like talk to get feedback or get, and you know, it's hard to get everyone together. And sometimes like you just, you don't necessarily don't need to have a meeting. And so, um, you know, if I want, like we're going through this website process right now and redesign. And so I'm like, I would like feedback from certain people on the site map or copy. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, I might need to explain it to them, but I don't need to have a meeting. And so you can make a quick loom video and like show your, you show your face on it and then walk through it and then they can leave and then just send it. Like, it's really easy. Just thinking oh. of ways like that, I think to have more like asynchronous communication versus getting everyone together and what turns into like a 30 minute zoom call when you don't really need it. Right. Right. No, that's pretty interesting. I'm going to jot that one down. I like yeah, that. no doubt. No doubt. I think uh, I'm gonna start flooding uh, my team with uh, just recordings of myself talking to see who actually pays attention. I'm asked like trick questions. What kind of wine yeah. was I drinking last night at 2am? So, uh, <laughs> Do a quiz afterwards too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Paul, I stole your thunder on that last one. You want to? No, take, no, uh, no. I, I, I actually, I kind of want to, I kind of want to piggyback off that a little bit. Um, I realize the whole thing's uh, remote, and you have these great communication tools. Um, and I'm assuming when we talked earlier about your connection with the sales team and how they help inform you, that's through all the same tools and maybe even Zoom calls. Is that? It is. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, there's like a sales channel in Slack. So I'm always, you know, looking into that and see what they're talking about. Um, and I feel like everything's open. You know, we keep open calendars too. So everyone's calendar is open. So you can all, you know, I'm like, oh, they had this meeting. So I want to join this. And it, I feel like there's just, there's a lot of transparency, which makes it nice and that you don't have to feel like you're, you know, I don't know, trespassing in if you want to join a sales call or a customer success call or something like that. And that's helped a lot. And like I said, if I can't join at that time, there's recordings on Gong that I can go listen to to catch up on something. There's also the transcript available of every single call. And it just makes it a lot easier when you're not in, you know, face to face with people. And, you know, some of that, of course, like I feel like water cooler or hallway talk is missed yeah. sometimes, obviously. But you know, there's ways to have that in Slack, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, jump on a quick call with people occasionally and just say, hey, can I grab 15 minutes and chat through this with you? Very cool. Very cool. And real quick, where was Tackle born? It was born in Boise, Idaho. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So our two founders um, live in Boise. And, you know, they've always... They didn't want to like go to a big city. They've lived there for a while and they were like, yeah, we're not going to go start a tech company in a big city. We're starting in Boise. So we're Actually, Boise yeah. born. That's amazing. I have, I have some good friends that moved to Boise and it, the proximity of what they've ever, what they've talked about, the proximity to the West coast, obviously stayed over, but uh, being close to Seattle and San Fran and, and yeah. things like that uh, made it almost um, like a new tech hub. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of, a lot of great things coming out of, coming out of Boise and the, and the tech space. So, um, that's that really inspires cool. me to move back to Puerto Rico. I gotta tell you, you know, <laughs> like, like just, you know, I don't need to be close to a big city tech hub. I just got to sit by the beach, you know, be all right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Back for a reason. Yeah. yeah. Kind of inspired some of that. I think of this moving of like, what, I don't need to be here. I can be anywhere to do this. Yeah. Yeah, and that's going to be the new trend, really. And we're seeing a lot of that already. Um, I was reading uh, uh, an article in Fastco Design just about how the collaboration remote um, and companies that are now just opening their eyes about, you know, I don't need you to be in the room next to me. I don't need to hover over your shoulder when, like many of the things that you mentioned, like we could have a quick conversation, share files, so many tools for real life sharing files. I mean, even Google Docs, right? Mm -hmm. um, where, where you could just collaborate. You know, the only thing missing is, like you said, the water cooler talk. You know, yeah. I miss, I miss uh, chugging beers with Paul at AMA events, you know, but, uh, but aside from that, I, you know, it's just, it's just my tea. Oh, you mean sipping on tea? Yeah, yes. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Right. <laughs> anybody that knows me knows that's crap. But, yeah, uh, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I know we're, we're coming up on some, uh, on time here, but, and we, we, 
we're going to jump in and look and see if we have any questions. Um, real quick, if there is anything you would like to leave the audience with, and we're going to talk about some questions here in a second, but are there three takeaways or key uh, uh, pieces of advice that you would give uh, to our audience and future listeners um, about exposing the gap and defining the, the categories, um, especially when you're in, a, in an industry that might be uh, shaping the category? Yeah, I think some advice I would have for that, um, if you're doing this, especially, you know, if you're in a smaller company um, or if you're in a bigger company, I think, you know, it could go either way, but is the first would be, you know, conduct research. If you can't hire a firm, if you don't have the budget for that, that's fine, but do it yourself. You need to do some sort of market right. research. Um, start with talking to your sales and customer success team, you know, listen to calls, use whatever's available to you. If, you know, even if you don't have a tool like Gong or something, um, and then don't let one person in like in your organization drive it all and say, well, I think we should do this. So we're going to go that way. Make sure, you know, you actually have data that you can go back and say, we're doing this because of X, Y, and Z. And then I think, um, you know, you've got to spend money on your brand if you're going to create a category. So you can ramp that over time. You know, you don't have to have $3 million marketing budget in year one or $10 million, but you have to get it out in front of everyone. And there are plenty of ways to be super scrappy about that and do it through con like creating a lot of content and SEO and, you know, you don't have to do a ton of paid ads or throw big, crazy events. You can't even throw big, crazy yeah, trips. Do them. Right. So that's awesome. Um, but you know, you just have to be, make sure you're invested in that and have someone in your organization who can really help you do that. And the third thing I would say, it's gotta be a top-down initiative that everyone in the organization who's like a senior leadership and your CEO believes in. You have to have these leaders doing their part and be talking about it um, to their networks and on social. I mean, you want a CEO and a CRO who are gonna be on LinkedIn sharing this message or write, helping you write blogs about this as well. It can't just be something that like marketing is producing this content. Um, make sure it's really, I think, a team effort and a whole company effort that when you're doing this and building this. Yeah, I love I love that last one, um, yeah. just from the standpoint of anybody that, that is listening and anybody that knows me knows I, LinkedIn is my favorite social platform, uh, really regardless of business or personal or, or anything. I just, I love that, I love the channel. Um, to that, what are some things uh, that, that uh, you, and you've mentioned social a couple of times with content marketing. Uh, what is, and I'm not asking you to give away the playbook by any means, but what are, what, what are you seeing um, as far as social? Uh, it, obviously LinkedIn, but anything else that kind of comes up? I mean, I think in the B2B software space, like LinkedIn seems have been the most effective tool that I've used for social media um, and getting the message out and having the right, I guess I would say like, you know, industry decision makers engage with us. Haven't seen as much success on Twitter with doing things. You know, we still use it as a platform um, to get the message out as well, but it just never really has seemed to grow from a, I think, corporate standpoint, but I think right. it's good for individuals to share on Twitter. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn just seems to be the strongest performer <laughs> that we have. I do think like also from social media, um, platforms like for blogging, so Medium can be a good one to start right. doing an outside blog there. And so we're, we're looking at things like that as we're doing this category creation right now. So there's other, ways you know we haven't gotten into anything crazy like tiktok yet at <laughs> tackle so but stay tuned who knows <laughs> never know you never know <laughs> yep oh that's that's a trip um all right so we just uh one more before we hop off uh to questions um long amazing career you know you've obviously learned a lot um been through several companies agency a lot of experiment experimentation um, who do you give? Who do you give a shout out to? Who do you give? Uh, 
you know, one of those, you know, thank yous for, for helping you along the way. Yeah. So it's a little untraditional, but I would say like the most influential thing for me has been Revenue Collective. I know you're like, you founded that, Nicole. That's weird. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a bigger organization. I mean, it's globally now more than 2,000 members. Um, I just, I lead the Atlanta chapter, which is now more than 100 members, but it's, it's a really great group of sales and marketing executives, VP level and above. And it's just been this great group of people that I never thought I would have access to learn from. So I feel like instead of just having like one person to lean on and that I wear out for advice all the time of like, hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? Um, I don't know how to do this. Um, I can, I go into the group. There's a great Slack channel. Um, there's huddles, smaller huddles for CMOs and VPs of marketing and just sharing the ideas and the value I've gotten from it is, just beyond anything I really could have ever have experienced and expected to get out of a group. And that's, it's been a game changer, I think, for my career. That's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. and, and can we join as, as agencies or will we get kicked out immediately? You, I, you wouldn't even pass like the application process. I would just be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you could totally come do like a webinar or something with us like that or do an Atlanta event. I will let you do that, Javier. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Just a little bit. Just a little bit helps. Awesome. Well, uh, awesome. let's go ahead and jump to questions. Paul, you want to take over? Take over? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think what's what's pretty cool here is we may have answered it. There was a there was a question coming in from Katie uh, about twelve fifteen, talking about suggestions for tools or processes for keeping the open dialogue between sales agents and the marketing team. Mm -hmm. um, I think we may have covered that, but just in case we didn't, we want to throw those, those names back out. And yeah. So. so I think, you know, any kind of recording tool that sales might use, you know, whether it's gong or chorus, like I think that's been immensely helpful for us at tackle. Um, you know, if there's a weekly sales meeting, um, sales is usually having some sort of weekly meeting from what I've, experienced at organizations, if marketing can sit in on that um, and hear what the sales team is saying, I think that always leads to good communication too. So you're hearing you know, maybe what their pain points are, what their challenges are, and then you can figure out ways that marketing can help bridge some of those gaps or also, you know, maybe present a few things of what's coming up in the marketing world. You know, sales always wants to know what webinars are coming up, what content's coming out. Um, you know, what campaigns are you working on? Things like that. So again, just keeping that dialogue open so that sales doesn't have to guess or keep bugging you in one-off slacks and things like that. Just have a, you know, a weekly like Google slide document that they could flip through to understand that, share it out in Slack after the meeting, present it each week. I can't overstate the need for over communicating things and sharing. You know, some people might visually see visually do better with it. Some people might see, some people might like to reference it and read. So I like to do it a few different ways. Yeah. Have you, um, I, I love the idea of almost being a, a fly on the wall, if you will, as a marketer in the weekly sales meetings. Have you had any pushback in your career of why is marketing here? Not really, because yeah. usually sales wants things from marketing and wants marketing to, you know, do something, whether it's creating more content, giving, driving more leads or something like that. So usually they're more than happy to have marketing there too. It helps with alignment. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's a big push of aligning marketing and sales and the MQLs, SQLs that I think, you know, working with a great sales leader, um, when you have a really good partner in that and that they understand how those two should fit together and like, yeah, marketing helps sales and we should, we want marketing to be a part of these things, then it's, it's easy. Like, that's a good fit. Yeah. Unlike back in the day where it was like, oh, here she comes, quiet, quiet, here she comes. Yeah, here she don't, comes. Say anything. Right, don't say anything, don't say anything. You know, yeah. they, don't, they don't want to, don't, don't let them steal our thunder. Uh -huh. um, we talked uh, about um, maybe some resources or, or aside from Revenue Collective, uh, books on leadership, anything that you could recommend um, for, for any of our audience, you know? Yeah. One book I've been loving that I just finished is called Growth IQ 
by Tiffany Bova. She was at Salesforce, or she's at Salesforce. Um, she's awesome. It's a lot about like the customer experience and growing through that process. So I really like that. Um, I'm a big fan of um, Brene Brown and her books. I just think that's, it really helps you with leadership and how to look at your team. So I would highly recommend any of her stuff. She has a podcast too. So check those out if you're more of a podcast person. Love it. Yeah, Love it. Podcasts are always great. Yeah. Got another question. Had another question. I uh, I totally messed that up. I, I asked for clarification late night uh, joining us. Okay. Again. And uh, go ahead, Paul. No, no. I think it was just more about uh, small companies. Um, and as small companies are looking to work with a marketing company, uh, what are some things that Obviously, you're in-house, but what, what, what are some things that a small company should be looking for when choosing a marketing agency, if you will? Sure. Yeah. So if you're outsourcing work, which, mm -hmm. you know, I do a lot of because, you know, I mean, you may not have the resources for headcount, but you're going to want to outsource projects. Um, and so I think some of the things that are important to look at um, are really understanding like if the agency is the right fit and like kind of aligns with your, I guess, program and strategy and like what you're doing. Um, sometimes I think people have like shiny object syndrome of like, oh, they're a big company and they've worked with all these really, really big companies. So I'm going to hire them. And if you're a smaller organization, then that may not be the right fit for you at that time. Like you may need to wait till you're, you know, like 50 million in revenue or a hundred million to work with that agency. So I would, you know, maybe look at, you know, what are their, how does the, who's the team that's going to support you? You know, are you going to have the resources you need at that time? Um, what is their deadlines and timelines? Like, like, are they going to match up to you? And there's also a big thing of like, you know, you may get sold by the founder of the agency on things, but then they're not going to be the one working with you on any of the project. And so I would want to meet the team too. That's going to be doing the day-to-day -day activity yeah. with you on anything. Um, that's important. Like there's, there's great like VPs of biz dev or something that'll sell you, but you, ne you never meet the team. Right. Um, right. And, process. and so I think that's kind of a miss. I'm glad, I'm glad you're talking about that. I, obviously it's a, it's a world I live in as well. And, um, you know, I always talk about, and I, and I would love to get your opinion on this. I always talk about credibility and capabilities are just really the cost of entry yeah. for any decision. It's really how compatible. And, and I, and you talk about like getting to know the team a little bit, who's touching mm -hmm. the day to day side of things. You got to have that trust, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a, no, that's so important. Um, I mean, I was actually thinking about this, like we had a not so great experience with an agency that we used to do some work for us. Um, and, you know, it was, again, it was kind of one of those things like getting sold by the higher up person and things like that. And, it, you know, I relate it to like, I have some great agents like Javier. I mean, Javier is an amazing the launch is so great. And I would love to work with Javier when I can, when we're at that stage and ready for that again. Like, but he's just like a great friend of that. I know I can tell like, Oh, we can't do this yet. But like one day we're going to work with you again. But it's like, you build this relationship, you build this trust with people. And I know if I was working on a project with Javier, I could go to him and say, Hey, something about this isn't working right. And um, this is a little off here. And if you're, when you're working with someone and they don't check in with you throughout the project and when you go to them and try and talk to them and say like, Hey, we're having trouble and this isn't working. And there's like no response to that. That's a terrible relationship. <laughs> yeah. And no. like a very toxic relationship. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll tell you something that has worked for us, including, you know, the relationship we had with when you guys were user IQ is when we pitch work, um, if, everybody that's in the room while we're pitching is not the team that's going to be there. Chances are that it's one or two people. Like we bring the team that's going to do the work and mm -hmm. we'll put proposals together. We actually list out everybody who's in it um, and who's going to do the work. Um, and like you said, so critical uh, to check in on your clients. You can't just sell something and walk away, um, you know, show up at the door, even if you don't have an appointment, even if there's nothing, 
you know, like go say hi. Um, and, and we do that with all our, you know, our client partners. And it, it seems to be really helpful because you may not be thinking about something right now, but when you see that person show up, you say, you know what? Hey, let me pick your brain for a second. And I think that's extremely important. And that's what a true partnership is about. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, anything else that we may have missed? I know we are, we, uh, once again, we try yeah. to keep these things really <laughs> short, but we have really incredible guests that, uh, that I feel like we could talk for hours with. Yeah. Um, I, I would say uh, to, uh, was that late night, late uh, yeah. Calhoun? Uh, back from last week. Back from last week. Thank you for joining again. Um, I think she may have, or he or she may have missed uh, the beginning of the show, which you talked about wine therapy, <laughs> right? And so yeah. I think wine therapy is also another, is probably another qualifier for yeah. choosing. Yeah. Right? yeah, yep, it is. If you can go drink <laughs> wine with your agency partner, I think that it's very important. Yeah. Wine very, is very wine. important. Absolutely. Well, yeah. is there anything else we uh, we didn't cover? Anything that you want to give a shout out to, Nicole? No, I mean, just you guys for having me on. Erica on my team, Childer, she was with me at User IQ and now she's with me at Tackle. Thanks for joining and listening. You're awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah, I believe Erica is head of content. Right? She is head of content and brand. So as you can imagine, she has a lot of um, fun work on her plate right now that she's working with me yeah, on. That's fantastic. Best of luck, Nicole. I mean, uh, Erica, and keep up the great work. Uh, the things I've seen out on LinkedIn have just been phenomenal. So um, what else, Hav? I, I think that's it. You know, I think that's the show for this week. Um, you know, again, episode 10, the final of season one with a big bang. Thank you so much, Nicole, for joining. Uh, it's always such a pleasure to talk to you. And, uh, you know, you have such great insights. I'm really excited to see how Tackle continues to evolve and the work that you guys are doing and how you grow the category. Uh, so, yeah, please keep us updated. And when those big things continue to happen, we'll just have you back on so you could brag about it for a little bit. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me. This was so fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining. And everybody else who joined, thank you as well. As always, we're going to put this episode up on uh, YouTube and then we'll share it out uh, via LinkedIn. We love LinkedIn as well. Yeah. Um, and so you can uh, listen to everything again, but then also share with your network and we will be coming back, right? That's right. Uh, that's right. We're going to be back August 7th and uh, we have an additional 10 episodes on August 7th. We're going to have a very important conversation uh, with a good friend of ours, uh, Jennifer Rogers Givens. She's a brand strategist and SVP of client services at Matlock Advertising and PR here in downtown Atlanta. And she focuses on multicultural br uh, brand strategies for some really, really big names in the industry. So um, she's been working in the business for a really long time and just helping clients come up with those strategies. It's gonna be an awesome conversation. That's gonna be August 7th, Friday, noon. Um, and then we'll start teasing out some of our guests that are coming up. So we'll send you guys, uh, you know, keep an eye on LinkedIn, keep an eye on Eventbrite, and check out YouTube, and we'll keep posting up uh, some updated content. So uh, thanks again, Nicole, Paul, Hair, Thank awesome. Thank you so much, Nicole. You know, you guys uh, have a lovely holiday, and uh, we'll see you back soon. Awesome. Have a great fourth. Have Bye. a great holiday, everybody. Thank you guys. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Hav. See you. Bye.